if you are an avid reader with dyslexia, your brain learns. Mm-hmm. And so it gets smoother and smoother and smoother. So language um, processing for non-dyslexics happens on the left side of the brain in three different areas. For dyslexics, it happens on the right side of the brain in only one area, which is apparently one of the reasons why it slows down our ability to read. Um, but our brain learns and it copes. Hello, writers and crafters. I'm Valerie Isan, and this is episode 156 of the podcast, and it's May 15th, 2024, as we record this. Today, I'm here with author A.B. Heron. Can I say your your real name on, on air? <laughs> yes, you can. Okay, this is Amanda, everyone. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about writing cross-genre and writing with dyslexia and a bunch of other things that I'm sure will come up in our conversation. Amanda is passionate about discussing the realities of being an indie author while being dyslexic, straddling the fantasy and romance genres, the importance of highlighting sex positivity in our society and the impact her background in anatomy and zoology has on her magic systems and world building. So I'm super excited to like dive into all those little juicy bits and talk about those. Um, First, we're going to go through some announcements and stuff. Um, Oh, before that, I just want to say thank you to all of our existing patrons for believing in us um, here on the podcast and with our work offline. You can become a patron of the arts at patreon.com slash Valerie Isan for books, writing instruction, coaching, planning, all the good stuff. And you can go to patreon.com slash strange air stories for short stories in the paranormal mystery genre. That's Eric's um, page. Uh, Eric is not here today. He's feeling under the weather and I was sick last week. So that's why we didn't have a podcast last week. So you can probably hear, hear it in my voice a little bit still. It's working for you. It's going around. So, uh, <laughs> uh announcements, uh, Eric's Pacific Northwest inspired horror. Um, I just blanked on the word. I keep wanting to say anatomy. Anthology. Anthology. (laughs) (laughs) Pacific Northwest inspired horror anthology. Um, Submissions are open until the stories are filled. So you can send your submission to caretakerpress at gmail.com. If you want to read a little bit more about it, you can go to caretakerpress.org. Um, the 2024 writer craft writing retreat and workshop is open for registration. You can go to valerieisan.com slash retreat and little bonus, um, announcement on this. I sent out, um, an email to my patrons and to my mailing list, and I have decided this year to try opening up the writing retreat to non-writers this year. And the reason why is because the the retreat theme this year is aligned action or aligned author. And, And so there's a bunch of things we're talking about in the workshops, like how to get past your limiting beliefs and how to um, set up like a value structure that will help you with your marketing, you know, but you know, it doesn't have to be about marketing. It can just be, Oh, what are my values and, and how do I make decisions and live my life? So it just seemed like there was a lot of, um, over, um, bleeding over crossing with, with the different, um, yeah, it just seemed like it would fit for non-writers as well. And so I thought, Oh, well, let's, I don't know. I just felt called to do it. So, so this year, even if you're not a writer, you can sign up for the, uh, writer craft retreat, valerieson.com slash retreat. Um, my last two books, I'm going to just plug them really quick. The three story method writing, how to books is out now and focus and finish goal setting and strategic planning for writers is out as well. And one last uh, links in the show notes. One last uh, thing I'll say is I am starting to teach a class tonight. Um, you can still sign up for it. 
in if you're local actually it's hybrid too so you could even do it virtual it's called exploring imagery in creative nonfiction. so that's going to be a six-week class on wednesday evenings pacific time six to eight p.m um and yeah so you can go to wordcrafters.org for registration for that if you want i think that is my end of announcements um my only author update was I was sick in bed <laughs> for most of, well, not most of the week, but Wednesday and Thursday, I was in bed all day long. Friday, I kind of like came out, you know, took a shower and <laughs> like did some dishes and just sort of like tentatively stepped my foot in the pool of doing things <laughs> and tried to give myself a lot of grace and move into, oh, I'm starting to feel a little bit normal now. And then I did a bunch of housework on the weekend because it was so needed because I hadn't uh, been doing anything. Up when you're sick. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I wrote my lesson plans in bed too. <laughs> like <laughs> impressive. I usually just, you know, lounge sick if I'm feeling that poorly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's my author update. What have you been up to? Oh, quite quite a bit. I I've, I've been nicknaming uh May May Mayhem because it seems like all the author things that I've started working towards this year have landed this month, um, which is your lovely podcast. And last weekend, I was at Barnes & Noble locally um, doing my first book signing. So that was a really fun wow, experience. Oh, that's exciting. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. I had some amazing, you know, uh, local and friend support that showed up. And then I got to meet some really cool new readers. And it was a really wonderful way to dip my toe into uh, book signings. That's awesome. That was your first book signing ever? That was my first book signing. Wow. And it was at Barnes and Noble. Way to go. Well, it it turns out if you are an indie author, at least in Oregon, and you have a um, Barnes and Noble nearby, you can walk in and say, hey, I'm local. Do you want to do a book signing? So they're they're testing the waters on doing that with local wow. authors. I think I'm going to put that little note in the in the show notes just for people if oh totally i've been have I've been talking about it on my instagram page and if people have questions like how did you get barnes and nobles i walked in and said hi <laughs> if you have a barnes and noble near you walk in <laughs> and just say you're local say you're a local indie author and ask if they are doing local signings um I also, my book is also with Barnes and Noble, so that made it very easy and doable. I guess if your book is not with Barnes and Noble, that might be a barrier for them. So um, you uploaded your files directly to Barnes and Noble or you just had it available via Ingram? It's available by Ingram. Okay. So just as long as they can order it for their store. Yes. They have all okay. the right numbers and ISBNs and, and ability to, to charge and such. So cool. Yeah. Well, that's a nice little tip. Okay. Um, let's see. Anything else I want to say before we get started? Announcements. Um, what are you reading? I usually ask okay. Eric that, but what are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> what am I reading? Um, I currently have gone back in time on my reading. I I was feeling so uh stretched thin by everything I was trying to do this month that I was like I just need to read some, like a comfort book mm -hmm. um and so I went back to my my favorite read from uh junior high high school uh Mercedes Lakey's Eras of the Queen uh trilogy Eras of the Queen Ar Arrows of the Queen Arrows Arrows of the Queen and it's a series mm -hmm. it was her debut series um three books they're they're wonderful, I, I, and it's funny reading them now, where I where I am as a writer and uh, an author versus where I was when I was you know a young adult. Um, they read a little differently, uh, but I still love the story and the world she built and the creativity. And she went from there and and created this amazing world that she just has all these trilogies that go in and follow different characters. And I really it, it was it was my first time I remember saying I want to be able to do this I want to do this for someone because I got so much out of the books at the time they really spoke to me and so that's that's where I've fallen back into my reading I have a 
list of to be read pile that is I don't know a couple of feet high at this point <laughs> as I'm sure we all do yeah and I was telling Eric that I'm in that place where I have started so many books because of just you know managing burnout and you know being sick too and yep I start books and then I just can't seem to get into them for some reason and I know that it's not the book it's me yeah <laughs> so I still have it in circulation you know I haven't like put it away and so I have a bunch of those and I am slowly I, I told usually when that happens I have to like just be firm with myself and be like all right this is the one I'm finishing <laughs> you know and like go through it and then put it aside and pick up another one from the pile of already started books and this is the next one I'm finishing so um I still haven't quite managed to uh, to do that, but um, I'm reading Slow Productivity right now oh. by Carl New um, Cal Newport. Have you read anything by him before? I've not. That's a that's a title I'm, and an author I'm unaware of. Is it? He writes nonfiction around like business mindset. Um, he wrote Deep Work. He wrote. Um, I'm blanking on the other work. one. Huh? I have heard of Deep Work. Yeah. And he had another one before that too, that I'm blanking on right now, but um, slow productivity is his new one. And I am really liking it so far. I'm about, I don't know, a third to a half of the way in. Um, and it's, I don't know, giving me some validation and some like, oh, that sounds so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see well, myself I there. <laughs> so yeah, I want I to, uh, that finish that first. Uh, I am still reading Thunder Song. Those are a book of essays by Sasha LaPointe. Um, so, you know, I dip into an essay and mm -hmm. I also went to um, a David Sedaris event last week. Um, oh, a lot of people have been yeah, telling me that. So I, uh, and I used to, my husband and I used to read his essays in bed to each other at night while we rubbed our feet. <laughs> Oh, lovely. <laughs> it was a lovely ritual, but you know, we kind of like went through his books, but I hadn't ever read Calypso. So I started doing that also. So that's another book of essays. Um, what else am I reading? The next one, um, it seems like most of the stuff I've got actually in circulation is all nonfiction. Oh no, I'm reading. I was going to say it's sounding like it. <clears throat> I'm reading Crow Talk by Eileen Gavin. That's the um, that's the last novel that I started um, while I was sick, so <laughs> it hasn't uh, it hasn't cemented fully yet. I'm like three chapters in, so that's probably what I'll be heading back to after slow productivity. I have been such a uh, fantasy and sci-fi reader for the majority of my life, and only in the last I'm going to say ten years have I finally started going outside of those um, two genres. And I'm finding uh, non-fictions that I'm just loving and falling into. Uh, I do nose work with my dog. So I'm mm. in a bunch of uh, some other different dog sports and I've found some amazing and I'm this is this is part of being a dyslexic is I don't remember authors names which are terrible unless I commit them to memory. Um, but uh, the Scent of the Missing was an amazing book, um, and it's a kind of an autobiography about this woman getting a getting and training a scent dog for search and rescue. And mm. I just I loved it, and I keep finding books in in that vein that um, are taking me out of my fantasy and, and sci fi comfort zone and leaning into more nonfiction. I will check that out because as we talked about before we hit record, like I'm totally into dogs <laughs> and I'm sure well, all of our listeners will remember <laughs> that. So, and we have a German shepherd that's four and she's so bored. I think she's oh, got a little Malinois her in her and I want to take her to agility. Uh -huh. Um, Cause the other two dogs we have are small ones and she just wants to pounce on them. You know, she <laughs> doesn't know. She's kind of, clumsy with her play with them and they're old and cranky and don't want to play with her so she's yep. like ah. <laughs> so we play with her you know with toys and tug and um she's not super great at fetch which is lovely if you have one dog that has a lot of energy if you can That's teach true. them fetch then they just oh 
that gets all their energy out. And my husband walks her two or three times a day. So she's, we're trying to get her exercise and get her stimulated, but uh, yeah, she needs another dog friend. But uh, so we were thinking agility classes. And, agility uh, is great. Nose work is great. Obedience is great. Um, honestly, any, the, the more mental you add in, it's going to be as exhausting as the physical. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Um, I was so surprised at how much more relaxed my dog is after doing nose work sessions. And so what is nose work? It. Oh, um, great question. It, nose work is it, competition nose work. So basically for people outside of um, uh, armed forces and, and police and stuff. So our dogs aren't sniffing for co cocaine or they're not mm. sniffing for bombs or they're not sniffing for, for marijuana. They're, they're sniffing for three different odors. Um, competition odors which are birch anise and clove uh -huh. and so we are uh, the competition nose work goes into four different environments so we have to do in interior searches yeah interior searches exterior searches container searches and vehicle searches um and then so you, you just have... like hide a little clove bud under the cushion or something and she <laughs> finds it um it's uh q-tips that have been infused with the odor and then they get tucked into containers so that the odor does not get spread all over because you touch it and then oh, you yeah. know you you touch your clothes or you touch the wall or you touch the chair mm. and suddenly the dog's like what it's everywhere uh -huh. um so they have to find source which would be the actual hive as we call it um so my uh my little guy he is um he just got up to nose work three in competition level which is a pretty big deal and That's so exciting yeah, i love dog I, stories what kind of dog is he he's a norwegian buhund um most people haven't heard of them i hadn't heard of them i'd had healers and border collie mixes and all of mine had been rescues and my last one was a, a she was a bit of a wonderful and terrible nightmare um, and taught me how to train. So I was like, I'm starting with a puppy this time. I'm getting a moderate energy breed. And I ran into them at um, a show I was uh, volunteering at by chance. Uh -huh. And there happened to be a breeder two hours away from me. And I was like, oh, and she had puppies. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, so, like most things I do, I dove in without doing as much research as maybe I should have. <laughs> well, on that note, I guess we can just start <laughs> talking about, uh, let me just uh, do your uh, real bio here. A.B. Heron is a dyslexic author residing in the Pacific Northwest. She works full-time, writes in the cracks between responsibilities and plays with dogs because she just can't help herself. For more insights into what makes her fantasy stories flourish, follow her on Instagram at a dot b dot heron h-e-r-r-o-n or check out her website abheron.com heron with two r's welcome to the podcast amanda thank you so much for having me valerie this is just i've been looking forward to this all week oh cool and we just found out um listeners that uh we live in the same town <laughs> almost i mean just the next yeah, one over much, so yeah that's exciting. We've decided we're going to have a coffee date. Yes, I can drag you into dog sports. Beware. Yay. Okay. I'm <laughs> like, so, okay. We have to like stop talking about dog sports. I know. Though, I'm sorry. It's it it a creativity and craft podcast. podcast. Like, Wait, I thought this was about folks. <laughs> so, um, so you write fantasy. I do. I write specifically adult urban fantasy. Okay. Um, uh, the, it seems to now be blooming into the genre of romance romanticy which is very hard for me to say um and i'm trying to do more reading in that genre just to see what what is out there and what people are getting so excited about um but basically i started writing not i, I the cliche of write the book you want to read mm -hmm. and so i started writing the book i wanted to read knowing nothing about following genres and and the, kind of the rules of marketing and and just was like hey, I want to write this story and I want to put this fun stuff in it and I want to do this thing. And so I did this thing and then suddenly learned about more about being an author a, author and genres and staying with in lanes. And it's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to category, I put this in a category now. Uh oh. So um, is this, when did you start writing then? 
So it sounds like you're kind of brand new at this or how long have you been I, writing? I would still say I'm I'm fairly new at this. I work a full-time job. So okay. I, I really do write, as I said, as you said, my bio and the cracks between responsibilities. Um, I started randomly really writing in 2017, 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was at the moment at that time starting up a new business at the, at the same time. So when I had downtime, which I had a lot of, I was just sitting in front of my computer typing chapters. Um, and I was doing it for fun and I was sending it each chapter to a friend of mine. Um, and she would get back to me every time I sent her chapters, like, where's the next one? I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> let's, let's do another chapter. Um, and it was amazing when I, finished the book and sent her the last pieces she called me and she's like you did it and I'm like what she said you did it you wrote a book and it was just such an amazing moment because it's like oh my gosh I I did she's like you nailed it you nailed the ending you actually it like holds together all these things that I was so not expecting or even really it's just I was writing for the joy of it and as a wonderful distraction at that time in my life that's awesome. So how many yeah. books do you have? You're writing a, in a series, right? The Tell yes, us the name of the series. Elemental Wolf series. Okay. Um, so there's two books in it right now. If if fate goes well, there will be a third book out this year. Um, and uh, I plan there should be five total in this series. Okay. Uh, that is that is the hope and where I'm going. I have a short uh, short fantasy story, not related, in an anthology called Seasons Unceasing um, by Word Writers Craft. I'm going to get it wrong. Wordsmith anthology. Uh huh. Um. So I it was fun to just kind of flex some more fantasy muscles that are that, that were just pure fantasy and world world building. So I enjoyed getting that out into the world. So take us back to your, your working full time, or you said you were starting your business. You had some free time. time. So what made you like, think I'll write this book. What what made you decide to start writing out of the blue? Like, I remember when I was in third grade writing little stories and, you know, <laughs> so I've always been like dabbling in words. What made you decide to all of a sudden out of the blue, just start writing? Um, I, I've always, I've always wanted to be a writer. I, I mean, you know, going through school it, and harking back to Mercedes Lakey and her novels, um, I, I just, it just called me. Like I, 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 I love crafting stories. I always told stories to my sister and her friends when we were growing up. Mm. Um, you know, I was always living in a book. Um, my, my parents, bless them, thank them. Oh my gosh um got us hooked on books when we were really young and I think that was one of the reasons I was able to become such a strong reader um and being dyslexic uh because I just wanted that story so badly mm -hmm. um so you know I, I I would have very vivid dreams I would write those down I would tell people about them um, I played around a little bit with starting a couple stories off in college, and then I never, never did much with them. It was just for my own enjoyment. Wrote a bunch of bad poetry. <laughs> I feel like all of us, as one of, does, <laughs> as one does, especially you know the angst of high school years and stuff. Um, but it was just, it was all just these little building blocks. And um, as I mentioned, when I was starting my business, I was kind of going through a, a rough, rough patch personally, and I was, I was writing stories just short stories for a friend just because and one of them I looked it was a different friend and I, one of them I looked at and was like there's more there there's a lot more there and I just I was like well why why not I keep saying I want to do it um I just started and it just started it flowed and it worked and and I had an audience of one who kept mm -hmm. asking for more and it just all kind of fell into place um yeah so that's a kind of a longer answer to your question <laughs> so you have so you write cross genre meaning you write in fantasy and in romance and you blend the two is that what you mean by cross genre um yes i i my 
my books have adult content. So they they <laughs> tend to fall a little bit more into the romance um realm and but they are they are urban fantasy rooted. Mm -hmm. Um and there is a romance story that goes that is going to be going through them. Mm -hmm. Um but it's not it's not a typical romance. It doesn't fall solidly in a romance niche because it doesn't have it's not a happily ever after ending it's happy for now mm -hmm. um, it's not the whole story is, is not revolving around the romance it's it's more of a more of a real life you know back and forth between I you know I it, it, he's my best friend but but do I really feel that way about him does he feel that way about me and then of course life happens and complications get put into the picture and um you know timing etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so it, it, it was really hard to put my book into a genre. Um, I, I fall more into the romance because of the spicy elements in my book, because of the sex positivity in my book. Um, it's easier to let a reader know what they're going to be walking into by, by couching it as romance. The covers are clearly fantasy though. You can see you know, the, the naked chested man on my cover. <laughs> no, the uh, looks like maybe a shifter. Is it a shifter romance or a shifter? Uh, fantasy? Yes, it's a shifter romance, paranormal romance. The main character, Nora, she is what I call Wolfkin. She has two souls. So she has a wolf soul and a human soul. Um, and she can shift back and forth from human to wolf. Um, she uh in the beginning of the book when you meet her she's been through she's been trying to live in portland as in a more human lifestyle and was dating a full human or mundane man um and it did a number on her and she ended up trying to conform um to his world and she kind of cut herself off from her wolf soul and so when you when you meet her she's she's trying to find who she is again she's trying mm -hmm. to reconnect with what she is and who she is um so I'm you've talking. talked about adult urban fantasy you've talked about romance and you've talked about paranormal romance um, and romanticy so yeah. so is this where the the cross genre <laughs> kind of comes in i mean when you're looking for this book in a bookstore where are you gonna be looking um i would i we put it in a romance section, mm -hmm. uh, a romance fantasy section, which then turns into romance, romanticy, mm -hmm. um, which is the big one right now. So, yeah, I've been seeing a lot of that new genre, like a, I guess. Yeah. Like a Yarrow's book, um, The Fourth Wing, I think has just brought that to the forefront for readers and really mm -hmm. like. And Sasha and Black's books are, are, are under that romanticy seems like yep all right so tell me what it's like i don't have dyslexia i know <laughs> several people that do um that are writers and and readers so what how does that how much of that plays in your writing in in the process of you sitting down to write like how does dyslexia get in the way or does it um it it does uh i mean i'm at this point in my life it's it's just who i am and how i work um but it was it was definitely a big barrier for becoming a writer emotionally because i was told so much in my formative years that you know writing is hard for you i it, uh this is going to be a challenge you know reading should be hard for you which it, thankfully because of my parents it never was the reading aspect of it um but spelling i am an atrocious speller every every word that i know how to spell i spell because i have memorized it not because <laughs> pro writing aid for the win <laughs> <laughs> um i a, anyone who can spell i think it's a magic trick it is like the best magic trick out there like i asked someone how do you spell you know for, for uh <laughs> caterpillar and they're like da -da 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 -da, and i'm like wow <laughs> um so it, it it's i have had to really look for editors who are technical editors um who can catch those things because 
spell spell check on a computer is phenomenal it has changed the game so many ways but as a dyslexic when you offer me five words that look similar I am not without definitions I am not going to be able to pick out the right word mm -hmm. so um mistakes that that have been found by uh editors for like instead of bowl as in you have a bowl of rice it would be a bowel mm -hmm. a bowel of rice well that's not doesn't work um uh, some more famous It'd be ones. technically true but not <laughs> not what you want to see when you're reading correct so so like in my book um Maltonoma Falls up in outside of Portland I mention it in my book well I had it spelled melanoma falls and <laughs> anyone who is not familiar with what the falls is and the spelling of it I mean it's it's yeah I was never in a million years going to correct that one <laughs> um but my friends who found it just got the best laugh out of it <laughs> thank you for finding it glad it made you chuckle um <laughs> So I guess I ask that out of readers. If you find mistakes like that in my book, just find them amusing because I've had so many pairs of eyes go over my manuscript and there are still going to be, uh, there's still going to be mistakes like that because they're not misspelled per se mm -hmm. when it gets to that point in my editing process. Because I can see the red line. I can fix the red line, but it uh -huh. doesn't always land on the right word. <laughs> So you said uh, you ask your your readers for grace when <laughs> when it comes to that. So do you have a good uh, rapport with your readers? Do you have a big mailing, not big mailing list, if with, but do you have a communication with if, your readers? Um, not as of yet. And honestly, I in my social media, I have not posted a ton about my dyslexia. Um, I'm finding it more something like if I start talking to a reader. Or I have someone bring up a mistake to me and it's like, oh, well, that's why. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I, I'm dyslexic. I don't necessarily see it. I cannot spell. Um, at the book signing, when I, I had to make sure I asked people, how do you spell your name? Even if it's a simple name, mm -hmm. I, I make sure I ask because I will mess it up. It, it's, <laughs> it's just the way I work. And so um, there was a lot of explanation in the book science, like, okay, I, I, Hannah, I get it. I, 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 I can see the word in my head, but how do you spell it, please? Yeah. Well, there's so, I mean, people get real creative with the way they spell their names too. That's true. And it drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I like seeing it, but yeah, you, you oh, have yes. to ask. No, totally, totally. But it's, um, I have a friend whose dog's name is Mar is Marley and I'm like, and she spells it in a very creative, there's, there's I's and E's and G's in there. And I'm like, I will never spell this right. <laughs> my, my best friend growing up, her name was Courtney. It took me six years to learn how to spell her name. <laughs> so that that's the that's the biggest hurdle with with writing is spelling. It also affects uh, my punctuation to a large degree. My my rules of punctuation are not cemented in my brain. Um, it's it's kind of a free flow concept when my brain looks at it. Um, I've discovered that uh, name rec or name recall is a big thing for dyslexics. It's a it's a huge stumbling block and challenges. Um, and I found that out recently within the last four years, five years. No one had ever flat out said name recall is is hard for dyslexics, at least not to me. Um, and that made me feel a lot better because I have a hard time remembering authors' names of books that I love. The mm -hmm. titles are easier. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, there's a, a lot of fun nuance there. And I could spit a lot of statistics at you too if you were well, let's go back to the emotional part. So you said originally that um that dyslexia was only an emotional barrier really for you to becoming a writer. So how did you how did you get past the limiting beliefs of writing's gonna be hard or I, sh I can't do this or whatever the negative self-talk mm -hmm. was, the limiting beliefs. How did you get past those limiting beliefs? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think I think it had to do with some of the bad poetry I mentioned. I, I had a friend in college. I would just start kind of showing her little things that I had written. And she was incredibly encouraging and uplifting. 
And I became very tentative with starting to like even talk about it. Like I'd like to be a writer and people were like, really, that, that would be amazing. And, and getting such a positive response again and again from people. And again, just showing little tiny bits at a time um, kind of gained the momentum of like, okay, it's not, it's not that I can't write, it's that I can't spell. And being able to have that become a distinction was a very powerful moment. Mm. Um, and also uh, getting in, getting into college. So I was in, I was in resource um, growing up. I was tested finally in third grade uh, and diagnosed. I was one of the lucky ones that got, got diagnosed early. Um, and so I had a lot of support going all the way through school. Um, and going into college, I knew I wasn't necessarily going to have the same su support. So I, my senior year of high school, I was like, okay, that's it. I'm not going to use resource. Um, I'm going to, I have to be able to do this on my own. So that was kind of the first step in building block of building my confidence of, you know, I, I, I am a smart person. I, I can do these these academic things these these aren't barriers they're just workarounds that mm. i have to you know work, work with and so that that carried on through college and that i had i had different unbelievable challenges in college with spelling because i'm a, I'm a science major i have a background in zoology and so when you have to learn all the latin names of all the critters mm. uh, and spell them correctly that was that was an incredible hurdle uh, but but that all just culminated in I can write I I that's I this is not something I have to shy away from this is something I can embrace um one more thing about the dyslexia I had a question on uh so you're an indie author do you use do you use vellum when you're formatting I don't I actually um I don't self-format I have there is a essentially a small small press publisher in town that I went with because okay. I had a uh, luminary press yeah I know yeah, um, I know Patricia. Patricia they're they're great they they don't own the rights of your book they just help you launch your book into the world mm -hmm. and they take care of the formatting and they take care of um they they have editing services if you want um I was not able to use them for that they will do uh, book covers if you want. They will get the ISBN numbers for you, um, and they will they will put your book up on Barnes Noble and Amazon, um, and they will just they will kind of help you into the the book realm. And they sit down and they have a little little marketing talk that they do, which is great. And they hook you up with a marketer up in Portland. You can have a little session with them. So they really, they really helped me step into this, which I was mm -hmm. so grateful for because I, I, I didn't know how to do anything. <laughs> okay. The reason, well, I guess I can ask this question in a different way then. So I use yeah. Vellum when I format oh, okay. my books and in Vellum, I don't know if um, draft to digital has this formatting tool, but, or Atticus, but there are dyslexic fonts or fonts I, that you use um, to make it easier for people with dyslexia to read. And I, have you, is that true? Like, <laughs> have you come across those fonts and thought, oh, this is so much easier to read. Like, should we as indie authors be making the choice to, to make versions like that or to put all of our books in that kind of font or... That's a great question. Um, and I am but one dyslexic in a in a, <laughs> in a sea of, of <laughs> in a sea of dyslexics. Um and, and there are apparently one in five people is dyslexic. So hmm. there's a large population of us out there, and some people have it's stronger for some than others. Um and it shows I, up differently too. It does, and it shows the up way it manifests usually yeah. with friends. So there's a lot of dyslexic that also show up with ADHD. Um there's a high percentage of that and if you have one dyslexic parent you're a 50 percent chance of having it if you have two dyslexic parents a hundred percent chance of having it um so it it has a lot of fun mine showed up with a, like a side car of uh, ocd to a small degree mm -hmm. um, so to answer your question 
I I have seen the faults. I don't know that they necessarily make it any easier for me, but mm -hmm. I mean, I lived with my face in a book uh, from as soon as I was six years of age. So it it hasn't, it, it didn't, font has not slowed me down okay. as far as a reader. I, and, and as you go, I, I'm assuming this works probably for more people. If you are an avid reader with dyslexia, your brain learns. Mm -hmm. And so it gets smoother and smoother and smoother. So language um, processing for non-dyslexics happens on the left side of the brain in three different areas. For dyslexic, it's, it happens on the right side of the brain in only one area, which is apparently one of the reasons why it slows down our ability to read. Um, but our brain learns and it copes. And so I have, my reading speed has increased tremendously. I don't know if the font would help. I'm sure it does help people out there. Otherwise, I don't know why it would be in existence. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's a great question. Do you, do you print, do you print books in that font to help people? I would, um, I would ask your readers, like, that would be a great question. How many dyslexic out, out there appreciate the font? Very cool. Okay. That is very interesting. All right. So I want to go back to, um, when we first, when I first introduced you on the podcast at the very beginning, we talked about, um, your background in anatomy and zoology and the impact that's had on your magic systems and your world building. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yes. Um, I, I like to say that I was raised by somebody who was on the magical or mystical side of things. And then I have my father who's very much on the logical double blind placebo testing, you know, show me the research side of things. So I have this wonderful split in my personality between science and fantasy. Um, and so I, I, I need my magical systems to make sense. Like it's, um, and, and of course it is fantasy, it is magic. So there's, there's a certain point where that has to break down, but, um, as far as I love doing comparative anatomy. So, um, my main character, because she is a, a wolf shifter, little things like um, wool, uh, wolves, dogs, canines, they have uh, seven um, lumbar vertebrae, whereas we only have five. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that they we have clavicles, they don't. Um, it, just looking at the, the structure of things, their uh, olfactory system is incredibly in tune and they have so many more olfactory uh, nose smelling <laughs> cells. I'm going to get, I'm going to start geeking out over anatomy. <laughs> um, but I, but I use that all, all that to say is I use that. So I, I, I have a short story somewhere where a guy was turning into a werewolf and he starts, one of the, the symptoms he has, he starts having terrible back pain because he's growing two new vertebrae. Mm. So, it, you know, it's, it's just, that is what I like to play with. That is what I like to look at. Um, how water works, how light works, how energy transfers. I I build the physical laws into my magic systems when I can. I'm taking notes. <laughs> can you tell us um, the, so you, you say you build physical laws into the magic systems. Is that what you said? Yes. Tell me an example. You said water systems or something like that. What you said well, mentioned just water, like like how like how water works or how um, uh, energy works or energy flows, uh, conservation of matter. So um, this is a little little bit of a spoiler. So that so I have I have um, Wolfkin in the stories, and I have what are called bear hearts. So people who turn into bears. So you you can't take a 200 pound man and make him a thousand pound grizzly, like, or, or I mean, you can, but how does that work? That's that's what I like to know, so how does that work? So at least in my magic system, this is a big spoiler, um, bear hearts, when they shift, they're, they're taking dark matter. They're pulling that into themselves to gain mass, to gain um, size. Mm. Whereas the wolf shifter, it, it's a 120 pound woman, it's a 120 pound wolf. There's not mm -hmm. a, 
a conversion of mass and matter in in that particular except for they're growing patient. more vertebrae uh, every yes, time they so, shift <laughs> yes so there's there's definitely the the change but then they lose the clavicle muscle. so <laughs> <laughs> it evens out yes exactly well and um and animals tend to pound for pound they they have more muscle mass than we do so you can have a 100 pound person and a 100 pound pet uh, or animal and that animal is going to have more strength to move more weight than people are because they have more muscle density there's more uh, muscle cells that are present so looking at uh, my characters they are physically stronger because they have more muscle density they have um, and they weigh a little bit more as a result so um, they tend to avoid hospitals and medical uh, human medical places that they can at all costs because they're a little physiologically different and you could take that down to the dna level mm -hmm. about that. but you get the idea so yeah <laughs> very cool um trying to think if there was another question i had i thought i had for you based on your the straddling of the fantasy and romance genres do you so when you you said earlier that once you started writing and and saying wow i've written a book so now i've got to figure out where to put this in the the marketing categories and and start putting on the indie author hat how did you um i guess make that transition from i'm sending a chapter a week or a month or whatever you know as it comes to your friend and your friend saying, by the way, you've written a book. Congratulations. <laughs> How did you get from that point to, oh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to make this a thing now. Um, it, it just definitely happened organically and, uh, it gained momentum. It, it just suddenly it was like, you have this book. What do you do with this book? And my friend's like, publish the book. I'm like, well, how do you publish a book? Um, if I it, honestly, if I could do this all over again, I would not have jumped immediately into publishing. If I could, if I could grab myself from from 2016 and just be like, finish writing the series, or at least write the first parts of the series, and maybe do some research on what it means to be an indie author. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm still learning. I, I guess we're all it's all one big learning process. But um, I have been so grateful for who I have run into in the book community, both where I live and also online, on Instagram, the book community on there, they rock. I've had so many questions answered. Um, but yeah, it just was like, I tripped and fell and started tumbling and was like, okay, find a publisher person over here. Somebody I knew, knew, knew Luminary Press. And they're like, go talk to Luminary Press and Luminary Press knew an editor. And, you know, it just, it just kept tumbling forward. So I'm, I was, running and learning as I went still am <laughs> um, but that's that's how watching water was was born there um this is actually the second iteration of the co cover um I learned more about cover art and ended up finding the amazing artist who did this and bringing bringing that to life um and then in retrospect again having it be a romance novel it might have been advantageous to perhaps have a more scantily clad male form on the <laughs> for the just, paranormal just romance fans immediately what it is um but i'm i'm liking the other the romanticy authors that are out there now like fourth wing you look at the and I, I keep referencing that because that's the one i read most recently mm -hmm. um which was amazing i loved it uh but the cover of that you look at that and it's like okay fantasy book look there's a dragon like i mean that that hooked me being a fantasy reader but it's so much more than that um and i can appreciate that we're seeing a little bit more of that in the romance genre it's not necessarily going to be completely in your face what it is um which i think is good and probably from a marketing standpoint also makes it a little more challenging but I'm I'm a fantasy girl at heart. I love I love fantasy covers. <laughs> nice. Um, is there anything that you want to say about your work or your experience as an author before as we as we wrap up? Um, 
oh gosh. <laughs> Basically, if you are out there and you want to write, don't, and if you have, if you're neurodivergent and if, if, if you have someone out there who's told you you can't, look at it in a different way and you can. <laughs> mm, that's wonderful. Well, tell us where people can find you and your books online. Uh, I have a website. Um, it is abheron.com, uh, two R's in the Heron. Um, I'm also on Instagram at a.b.heron. Um, and then my books can be found on Amazon, uh, both digital and um, paper copies. And you can also find them at Barnes & Noble um, online for paper copies. Um, and I'm hopefully going to be finding other venues where my book can uh, shine. So nice. And again, well, with any luck, the third book will be out this, this year. That's what I'm pushing for and keep the story going. The, there is a romance, um, authors, uh, book fair up in Portland at the end of the month. Uh, mm -hmm. it's a hot and steamy, um, romance authors 2024 uh it is may 30 may 30th friday and then saturday june 1st um i will be at the friday hidden gems author portion of it and uh thank yeah you. i'll put all the links in the show notes and um yeah thanks so much for talking with me today it's been uh, really I appreciate fun you taking the time this has and been wonderful. we'll totally have coffee yes let's do coffee that'll that'll be fun <laughs> all right bye for now bye